Welcome to another edition of Sound Off Extra here on the official YouTube channel for the Solomonster Sounds Off Wrestling Podcast, which drops each and every Sunday on the Solomonster.com, also available in iTunes, Stitcher Radio, and TuneIn Radio. Plus, we have a free Android app for those of you who have access to the Google Play Store, so you can download our app there and stream the show that way. Uh, this will be the final Sound Off Extra, most likely, of 2014 as we head into the new year. And I just want to take a moment to thank everybody who has made this show a success and who has made this YouTube channel a success. We recently blew past 11,000 subscribers. We're already marching our way up to 12, and that's because of you guys. So if you haven't already done so, if you're listening to this video right now, watching it, whatever, uh, hit the subscribe button. There's a subscribe button in the video. There's one below the video. Hit that button right now and subscribe to this channel so that way when brand new videos like this one go up, you will be alerted about it first before anybody else. So thank you again for all of your support. What I'd like to do here is take a few minutes to give my thoughts on the Iron Sheik documentary uh, that was released earlier this year. Uh, got some honors at a film festival. I've heard a lot of good things about it. It's available right now through iTunes as a purchase for $12.99. Uh, and I would absolutely recommend it to anybody, whether you're a wrestling fan or even a non-wrestling fan. Unless you are absolutely offended by the Iron Sheik and you don't like him at all. Obviously, you want to stay away from a movie then about the Iron Sheik. I think that goes without saying. But as somebody who's been a wrestling fan for almost my entire life, and I go back to when, you know, Sheik was in the WWE around the time, even shortly thereafter, he lost the championship to Hulk Hogan. So at that point, he really wasn't a major force in the company anymore. That's really what I knew of him growing up as a kid. And then, of course, I knew him as Colonel Mustafa when they brought him back to be with the Iron Sheet or uh, Sergeant Slaughter, I should say, and General Adnan. But I learned a lot watching this documentary, mainly about his early years that I just did not know before. And to me, that was, I think, in, in a lot of ways, the best part of the whole documentary. So what we'll do here is we'll just go through the different people who appear making comments and giving interviews in the DVD, some really big names you wouldn't expect, and just give a really quick synopsis about the life and times of the Iron Sheik. Real name is Khosro Vaziri. Uh, his wife, Carol, uh, their two daughters, his grandkids are all featured pretty prominently in the movie. His wife especially has a lot of comments. But here's the, uh, the list of people. It's possible I'm missing one or two. Uh, this is the list I compiled after the fact of people who... Uh, at some point gave comments to or sat down for interviews for the movie, which runs a little over 90 minutes, by the way. The Rock is in the movie. Uh, he credits the Iron Sheik with coming up with the phrase jabroni long before he ever made it popular. The Rock is in the movie quite a bit. Jim Ross is another one who's in the movie. He's all over this thing. Hulk Hogan, uh, they caught up with him at, uh, at a convention at some point, and I guess they sat him on a couch. There's some comments from him in here. Mick Foley... Bret Hart, Bruce Pritchard uh, was all over this thing too, Jake the Snake Roberts, Hacksaw Jim Duggan, Superfly Jimmy Snuka, and I gotta say, it was priceless that the one comment, they only have one, the one comment in the entire movie that they use from Jimmy Snuka is of him talking about the death of Sheik's daughter, one of his daughters, uh, who was murdered, which, it was a domestic abuse incident of all things, and there's Jimmy Snuka, of all people, given his own past, talking about how, oh, she was someone's daughter, and I just, I felt slimy even listening to the guy. But he's on there. King Kong Bundy, Cowboy Bob Orton, the Nasty Boys, Jack Black is in the movie. Seth Green, who just hosted Raw a few weeks ago, and they have clips from the Robot Chicken episode they did a few years back mocking the old Hogan's Hero show, only they used the old uh, WWF wrestlers from the 80s, Hulk Hogan, Sheik, Piper, Bundy. That was actually a really funny episode. If you've never seen it, you might want to go find it. So a lot of big names, a lot of some celebrities, but a lot of big wrestling names featured in this movie. This was not a WWE production, by the way, so that makes it all the more impressive. They were able to round up all these people to sit down for interviews. And it just goes to show you what they think of the Sheik or the impact that the Iron Sheik had on their careers. Um, but you know what? Even though WWE didn't have anything to do with this, to my knowledge, this is exactly the sort of thing that belongs on the WWE network. They, they, they should buy the rights to this thing and air it on the network. Absolutely. This is exactly the sort of thing that should be on there. And it's not. 
The filming was done over the last six or seven years. I want to say it went from 06 to either this year, maybe 2013. So this was filmed off and on over the course of several years. Uh, we get to see footage of Sheik from back in the day at his highest of highs. They've got some really rare still shots and some, some footage of him when he was much younger in Iran uh, or Iran, as he says. Uh, him as an Olympic wrestler, him as a bodyguard for the Shah of Iran and his family. He was treated, in, in many ways, he was treated like royalty by the Shah. Uh, he and the other big-name wrestler from Iran, who the Sheik says was the greatest wrestler, even greater than himself, to ever come out of that country. Uh, the guy was a national hero. It was this guy Takti was his name. People loved this man. And Sheik told the story once of being in the Shah's palace one day with Takti. And the Shah asks them, oh, what would you men like? You want cars? You want a house? You want money? Because these guys were representing Iran to the rest of the world. They were some of the best athletes in the world at that time. Very well respected. And so they were treated accordingly by uh, the regime in that country. And the Sheik says that uh, Takti looked at the Shah and he said, I would rather you take that money and invest it in new highways and roads and new schools and universities. And the Shah got really angry when he heard this, and he stormed out. Uh, I read up on Takti after the movie because I wasn't familiar with the guy beforehand, and uh, I found this very interesting. And he apparently was he was very much anti-Shah and anti the regime in power at that time. He was a man of the people. Anyway, uh, they end up finding Takti dead later on in his hotel room of what the government called a suicide. Sheik says there's no way that this guy committed suicide. There's, it would make no sense for him to have taken his own life. It was the government. They were behind it in some way. They assassinated him. Uh, that's the implication anyway. And that's when the Sheik says he knew he had to get out of Iran or else that was liable to be him next. And he didn't want to turn out the way that Takti did. So he came to America, and that's where he met his wife, Carol, who, as I said earlier, has a big role in this film. You know, it's funny, you look at Sheik back in his younger years, they have a lot of photos of him back when he was younger, and not for nothing, you know, he was a good-looking dude. He had a full head of black hair, he had these washboard abs, all muscled up. Uh, the polar opposite of the Iron Sheik with the shaved head and, and the big gut. Uh, he was not a man to be messed with back in the day. He says that when he came over and he was in Minnesota, he was doing stuff with Vern Gagne and the AWA, he said there were guys that didn't want to work with him because they knew how much damage Sheik could do if he wanted to. He was a shooter, and they didn't want to fuck with the guy, so they were almost afraid to work with him. Uh, they do talk about him winning the championship from Bob Backlund in WWF and dropping it to Hulk Hogan a month later and how Vern Gagne who the Sheik, again, had worked for in Minneapolis before he went over uh, to WWE. They even have a picture from the Sheik's wedding, and Vern Gagne was there. He was at the wedding. Uh, so they were somewhat close, at least. Vern allegedly promised, and we've heard him tell the story before, some variations of it, but according to the Sheik, Vern Gagne promised him $100,000 if he would break Hulk Hogan's leg in the match they were going to have at Madison Square Garden and bring the title to Minneapolis with him. And Sheik says, I had given my word to Vince McMahon that I would do the honors for Hogan. And that's what he did. He's a man of his word. Uh, he couldn't break that bond, and so he didn't do it. He made Hulk Hogan that night in the garden. You know, that was an iconic moment. Hogan as this real American hero beating the evil Iranian Sheik to win the world championship. Back at a time, I think, in the world, and at a time in wrestling in the 80s, you, you constantly had these nationalistic angles like this. And you saw it even in the NWA, Crusher Khrushchev, and all these different characters, the evil Russians, you know, because back then it was the Cold War. We were coming off the Cold War. It was the USSR, which didn't really fall apart until uh, the beginning of the following decade. So they were constantly doing angles like this, you know, the USA hero against the evil foreigner. Uh, and that was an iconic moment, and that helped make Hulk Hogan into this big star that he would become in WWE. And the Sheik had a big part in that because it could have gone south really quickly and really badly. He could have made Hulk Hogan look like a fraud, and he didn't do that. Uh, they talk about the incident in 1987 where uh, the Iron Sheik and Jim Duggan, who were bitter rivals on TV at that time, 
they got busted. I think they, I think it may have been uh, driving down the New Jersey Turnpike, going to a show. They were busted for drug possession. How awful it was for Sheik, especially you know for him more so because he was fired. And Duggan also lost his job. I think although he came back a lot uh, sooner than the Sheik did. Sheik didn't come back for many years, uh, and he was never the same after that. But it was tough for him because he almost lost his house because of it. You know, he was wrestling indie shows afterwards. Uh, it was really also the first incident that broke kayfabe on a grand scale. They showed all of these different newspaper headlines at that time when it's, when it became a big story, asking, is WWF fake? Uh, I mean, it really pulled that curtain back big time in a way that had not it had not been pulled back at that time. Now, it would have happened anyway, it was inevitable, but you still had tons of people at that time. And, and we're talking really intelligent people, media people. I don't want to say they were stupid, it was a different time. It, it's funny now to look at it when you still have people that go, well, you know, WWE is fake, right? I mean, when I hear that now, I, I'm like, are you from this planet? But back then, there was still that element of people didn't know. You know, wrestling was not as open as it is today, and this incident just thrust it into the spotlight uh you just weren't sure at that time you weren't sure if wwe was fake or not and now they had their proof the media had their proof and they ran with it these two bitter rivals you know popped riding in the same car together doing drugs it was really a big deal at that time uh of course like i said both guys did end up getting hired back later on but they never and dug in too they never got back to that same level of push they had before uh Duggan, you could argue maybe maybe he did for a time because I know he he did have some main events with Andre in '88 at some shows, but as far as like a major angle or a major program on TV, um, and I think Duggan in his book, which I haven't read but I've heard him talk about it, made uh, a reference to there being a plan for him to be a main event guy in '88 and either be the world champion or a challenge for the world title. I I find it hard to believe that there was ever a plan for Jim Duggan to be a you know, the world champion in WWF, but I absolutely believe that uh, there could have been and may have been a plan for him at one point to feud with uh, the champion at that time for the title because Duggan was actually positioned pretty high up on the card before they moved him down into a mid-card slot. I could see Duggan challenging in 88 with Hogan gone uh, for the championship against maybe... Ted DiBiase had things turned out a little bit differently. You know, DiBiase, it was rumored that he was going to win the title in that tournament at WrestleMania 4, but Hockey Tonk Man didn't want to drop the Intercontinental belt to Savage the month before, and so to appease him, they put the belt on Savage instead. Uh, and DiBiase, too. At least, hey, DiBiase himself is of the impression that he was going to get the title, and it didn't happen. But DiBiase and Duggan back in the Mid South era were uh, rivals, and they had some great classic matches. Uh, I think that, uh, what was it, the coal miner's glove tuxedo match inside a cage. It's this famous match. I think it's on the, uh, they did a Mid-South DVD. But anyway, I could see that. I could see Duggan being put in a position to challenge DiBiase, revive their feud on a national scale in 88. It didn't quite work out that way. Uh, and Sheik, even more so, when he came back in 91... They wouldn't even call him the Iron Sheik. They gave him a completely different gimmick, a completely different name. They put him with Slaughter and Adnan. Uh, he wasn't very good, to be honest with you, at that point. He was never, ever the same after that. Uh, and so from the highest of highs, it also chronicles the Sheik's lowest of lows. At one point, they actually film him in the movie. They film him buying, it's either crack or marijuana. I'm not sure which, from somebody on the street. He did both. He was doing both drugs at that time, but... His wife says he had a crack problem, so it may have been crack. Uh, this is after his daughter's death. That's when things really started to spiral out of control for him. One of his daughters was strangled by her boyfriend, a guy she had known, I think, for all of a month. And he killed her, and she never really got over it. Even to this day, he's never really gotten over it. It was the saddest part of the documentary by far, because you can really tell how much of an impact that had on him. I mean, any parent loses a kid, let alone the kid gets murdered... That's not the sort of thing you get over. You don't get over that. And Sheik, in the movie, they make it very clear he was always very protective, maybe overprotective, of his daughters. Uh, he wouldn't even let them date until after they graduated college. They'd have to sneak around with boys without him knowing. 
but then the drug problems take over and it just wrecks his whole family. His wife left him for a while. He had to move into his own little apartment. And it wasn't just his daughter's death. He talked about all the injuries from wrestling. They show his ankle at one point. It's all purple and swollen and nasty. Um, he, he medicates. He self-medicates, plain and simple, to take the pain away. Jake the Snake is on there talking about... I mean, nobody knows better about self-medicating and having issues with injuries and depression and drugs than Jake the Snake Roberts. It's amazing he's even alive today, let alone doing as well as he is with the, you know the DDP yoga stuff. I'm happy to see it, but Jake Roberts was well on his way to, to death. It's amazing he's still around to, to tell the tales of what he went through back in the day and all that shit that he put in his body. So it's kind of appropriate to have comments, I think, from him on here because he can give us a perspective on the, the Sheik's drug problems that very few other people can do. And that's really, I think, why they have him in the movie. You know, he, Jake's on there talking about how you self-medicate so it all just goes away and you can make it to the next day. Thankfully, though, the story does get better. They don't. I, I actually like the fact they focus on the drug stuff. It'd be very easy for them to just gloss over it and ignore it, and I feel like they don't. Uh, do they go into how deep it really is or really was? Who's to say? But they don't shy away from it. They don't sugarcoat it. Uh, the guy was doing a lot of bad shit that he shouldn't have been doing, and there's some tense scenes in the movie of him in his house being filmed and interacting with his wife and snapping at his wife and she's trying to get through to him and it's just not working and he just wants to be left alone so that's all there it's all on camera in the movie but again thankfully it does get better he still has his bad days but he's since curbed his drug use supposedly uh, over the last couple of years he's doing better he's now a social media celebrity that we all are well aware of they showed the youtube video of how it all got started it was after michael richards uh, who played Kramer on Seinfeld. He went on that race, racist tirade at a comedy club many years ago. And so she recorded a video for YouTube talking about how he would break Kramer's back in the camel clutch. He would fuck his ass. He would make him humble. And the thing went viral. It racked up hundreds of thousands of hits. And after that, he just blew up. Howard Stern would have him on all the time. I mean, look, Sheik is not a dumb man. It's all part of the con, it's all part of the act. It's his gimmick now, and he knows that, and it keeps him relevant. You know, he's he's a social media sensation on Twitter. The guys who did the movie grew up as fans of the Iron Sheik, and they talk about how his English can be hard to understand, but they do the best they can to take what he says legitimately and put it on Twitter so it's not actually Sheik tweeting himself, you know, in his own hands, but uh, according to them, it is his own words, it is his own thoughts. I've always been skeptical of that myself, but according to them, it is, it's the Sheik. Uh, but everywhere he goes now, people know who the Iron Sheik is. They love the Sheik. They have photo after photo in the movie of him posing with every celebrity under the sun. It's comical. I mean, he, he's way more famous now than he ever was in 20 plus years of wrestling. You know, it's, it's, it's comical. Uh, last year, I had the, the great fortune of going to an Iron Sheik roast. Uh, me and my buddies, we went to WrestleMania 29, which was local. It was in New York and New Jersey. And they had, uh, I think it was Peter Rosenberg of Hot 97 here in New York. He'll have wrestlers on on occasion for interviews. He organized the whole thing. It was a roast to the Iron Sheik. It was at Caroline's Comedy Club in New York City. We got tickets to it. It was a fucking blast. I mean, we had so much fun. It was maybe the most fun we had that entire WrestleMania weekend. Uh, WrestleMania 29 was not one of the better WrestleMania shows. So the Sheik roast was a highlight, and uh, MVP was there. I remember him being really funny. Jay Lethal, poor Jay Lethal. Uh, <laughs> I've interviewed Jay Lethal on my show before. I've talked to him. He's a nice guy, uh, really talented. It's criminal that TNA let him go for reasons I still can't comprehend, that WWE hasn't snatched him up. I mean, for as many years as Jay Lethal has been in wrestling, he's still only like 28 or 29 years old. But anyway, Jay Lethal was there, and he was doing his Macho Man impersonation, which is awesome. But unfortunately for him, it did not get over with the audience that night. I, I felt bad for the guy. He bombed. He knew it. He knew that he bombed big time. But it was still funny. You know, and the Sheik was there. He was in rare form, saying things that you would expect the Iron Sheik to say. It was a lot of fun. And that's really what I think of when I think of the Iron Sheik these days. I think of fun. 
The movie was made by guys who were, and still are, big fans of the Iron Sheik. So, is it completely unbiased? Probably not, but even still, they didn't shy away from the drug stuff, and you come away from it feeling it was a lot less biased than some of the things you'll see, for example, like the Monday Night War stuff on the WWE Network. Okay, that's for sure. Uh, if you're a wrestling fan, you'll enjoy this. Even if you're not a wrestling fan, I think you'll enjoy it. The most fascinating stuff to me was his younger years in Iran that were covered early on in the film. Uh, later on, you get to see all the loony stuff that people have come to know the Sheik for. But I think it's important for people who only know that side of the Iron Sheik to gain some insight into his background. Otherwise, he's nothing more than a, you know a cartoon character to people. And that's too bad because there's a real interesting story behind the character that people see fucking people in the ass. And I never thought I would do a review that ends with that line, but I guess I just did. Uh, but absolutely, I recommend checking it out. You can grab it right now on iTunes as a download, $12.99. That's to buy it. You can rent it for $4.99 if you don't want to just buy the whole thing. Check it out. I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, send me your feedback, thesolomonster at gmail.com. If you have questions for me, you know, we do sound off inbox extras here on this channel as well. If you have any other comments, you can post them down below this video right here on YouTube. Uh, follow me on Twitter, at Solomonster is my handle on there. And again, you can check out full episodes of the Solomonster Sounds Off podcast. It's a weekly show, typically airs on Sundays. You can grab it directly on our website, thesolomonster.com, stream it, direct download it. You can grab it in iTunes. Stitcher Radio, TuneIn Radio, and we have a free Android app. You can stream it from there in the Google Play Store. So thanks to everybody for listening. Hope you had a great 2014. I look forward to doing more of these coming up in the new year, 2015. And until then, be well, stay safe, and we will be back very soon with a brand new Sound of Extra right here on YouTube. Take care, guys. Two daughters, his grandkids are all featured pretty prominently in the movie his wife especially has a lot of comments but here's the uh the list of people it's possible i'm missing one or two uh this is the list i compiled after the fact of people who uh, at some point gave comments to or sat down for interviews for the movie which runs a little over 90 minutes by the way the rock is in the movie uh, he credits the iron sheik with coming up with the phrase jabroni long before he ever made it popular the rock is in the movie quite a bit Jim Ross is another one who's in the movie. He's all over this thing. Hulk Hogan, uh, they caught up with him at, uh, at a convention at some point, and I guess they sat him on a couch. There's some comments from him in here. Mick Foley, Bret Hart, Bruce Pritchard uh, was all over this thing too. Jake the Snake Roberts, Hacksaw Jim Duggan, Superfly Jimmy Snuka, and I gotta say, it was priceless that the one comment, they only have one, the one comment, in the entire movie that they use from Jimmy Snuka is of him talking about the death of Sheik's daughter, one of his daughters, uh, who was murdered, which it was a domestic abuse incident, of all things. And there's Jimmy Snuka, of all people, given his own past, talking about how, oh, she was someone's daughter, and I just, I felt slimy even listening to the guy. But he's on there. King Kong Bundy, Cowboy Bob Orton, the Nasty Boys, Jack Black is in the movie Seth Green, who just hosted Raw a few weeks ago, and they have clips from the Robot Chicken episode they did a few years back mocking the old Hogan's Heroes show, and only they used the old uh, WWF wrestlers from the 80s, Hulk Hogan, Sheik, Piper, Bundy. That was actually a really funny episode. If you've never seen it, you might want to go find it. So a lot of big names, a lot of some celebrities, but a lot of big wrestling names featured in this movie. This was not a WWE production, by the way. So that makes it all the more impressive. They were able to round up all these people to sit down for interviews. And it just goes to show you what they think of the Sheik or the impact that the Iron Sheik had on their careers. Um, but you know what? Even though WWE didn't have anything to do with this, to my knowledge, this is exactly the sort of thing that belongs on the WWE Network. They, they, they should buy the rights to this thing and air it on the network. Absolutely. This is exactly the sort of thing that should be on there. And it's not. The filming was done over the last six or seven years. I want to say it went from 06 to either this year, maybe 2013. So this was filmed off and on over the course of several years. Uh, we get to see footage of Sheik from back in the day at his highest of highs. They've got some really rare still shots and some, some footage of him when he was much younger in Iran, uh, or Iran, as he says. 
Uh, him as an Olympic wrestler, him as a bodyguard for the Shah of Iran and his family. He was treated, in, in many ways, he was treated like royalty by the Shah. Uh, he and the other big-name wrestler from Iran, who the Sheik says was the greatest wrestler, even greater than himself, to ever come out of that country. Uh, the guy was a national hero. It was this guy, Takti, was his name. People loved this man. And Sheik told the story once of being in the Shah's palace one day with Takti. And the Shah asks them, oh, what would you men like? You want cars? You want a house? You want money? Because these guys were representing Iran to the rest of the world. They were some of the best athletes in the world at that time. Very well respected. And so they were treated accordingly by uh, the regime in that country. And the Sheik says that uh, Takti looked at the Shah and he said, I would rather you take that money and invest it in new highways and roads and new schools and universities. And the Shah got really angry. Welcome to another edition of Sound Off Extra here on the official YouTube channel for the Solomonster Sounds Off Wrestling Podcast, which drops each and every Sunday on the Solomonster.com, also available in iTunes, Stitcher Radio, and TuneIn Radio. Plus, we have a free Android app for those of you who have access to the Google Play Store, so you can download our app there and stream the show that way. Uh, this will be the final Sound Off Extra, most likely, of 2014 as we head into the new year. And I just want to take a moment to thank everybody who has made this show a success and who has made this YouTube channel a success. We recently blew past 11,000 subscribers. We're already marching our way up to 12, and that's because of you guys. So if you haven't already done so, if you're listening to this video right now, watching it, whatever, uh, hit the subscribe button. There's a subscribe button in the video. There's one below the video. Hit that button right now and subscribe to this channel so that way when brand new videos like this one go up, you will be alerted about it first before anybody else. So thank you again for all of your support. What I'd like to do here is take a few minutes to give my thoughts on the Iron Sheik documentary uh, that was released earlier this year. Uh, got some honors at a film festival. I've heard a lot of good things about it. It's available right now through iTunes as a purchase for $12.99. Uh, and I would absolutely recommend it to anybody, whether you're a wrestling fan or even a non-wrestling fan. Unless you're absolutely offended by the Iron Sheik and you don't like him at all, obviously you want to stay away from a movie then about the Iron Sheik. I think that goes without saying. But as somebody who's been a wrestling fan for almost my entire life, and I go back to when you know Sheik was in the WWE around the time even shortly thereafter he lost the championship to Hulk Hogan so at that point he really wasn't a major force in the company anymore that's really what I knew of him growing up as a kid and then of course I knew him as Colonel Mustafa when they brought him back to be with the Iron Sheet or uh, Sergeant Slaughter I should say in General Adnan but I learned a lot watching this documentary mainly about his early years that I just did not know before and to me that was I think in, in a lot of ways the best part of the whole documentary so what we'll do here is we'll just go through the different people who appear making comments and giving interviews in the DVD, some really big names you wouldn't expect, and just give a really quick synopsis about the life and times of the Iron Sheik. Real name is Khosrow Vaziri. Uh, his wife Carol, uh, their 